The Ohio River carries a good deal of history. But you have to look for it. You can begin to do that at the Falls of the Ohio State Park in Clarksville, Indiana. or at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati. You can visit the newly installed Unknown Project Memorial on the banks of Freedom along the Louisville waterfront. or check out museums in Louisville and New Albany, Indiana. You can walk the older city streets, noting historical markers that direct you to stories of past settlement and the people's varied connections to the river. If you go to the Big Four Bridge that connects Louisville and Jeffersonville, Indiana, you might get a glimpse of industrial transportation. The barges carrying minerals, chiefly coal, mined in the region, heading to coal-fired power plants along the river. If you make your way to historic Portland, first a separate city, later a neighborhood within Louisville, it might require a good deal of imagination to look beyond the high flood wall, the vegetation, and the elevated highway of more modern times to sense an earlier history when this was founded as the port stop with a busy wharf just below the falls or the rapids, that navigational obstruction on the river that made Louisville a necessary stopping point for traders. Before 1830, when a canal bypassing the falls was finished, all river traffic would require a stop, with cargo unloaded and carted past the falls, to be reloaded, in some cases, after the lightened vessel was taken over the rapids. The river reflected, and still reflects, the culture of the inhabitants of the region. It's a mirror of its economy, as it carries materials that do many things, including fueling and building prosperity, for some. Materials that we might not think too much about, until something happens and we pay attention in a new and different way. In the early 19th century, after European colonizers and settlers had moved in and displaced much of the native population, a good deal of what the region produced for sale was carried down the river by flatboat to the thriving markets in the deeper south. Abraham Lincoln's travels down the Ohio and Mississippi beginning in 1828, are a well-documented example of this form of commercial transportation. 
I came to be occupied with the river and its cultural and economic history through a combination of reading and a visit to a friend whose small farm lies on the riverbank in Breckenridge County, Kentucky. I had been reading about the history of slave escapes from the slave states in the south to the freer north where the Ohio River marked the beginning of a boundary between slavery and freedom. And I came upon an incident long ago that transpired very near to where my friend now lives, just to the north of Stevensport, Kentucky. To appreciate the story, we need to understand a feature of the trade down the river in the early 1800s, one that became a major part of the economy for the whole region. The enterprise of buying up the surplus unfree human laborers, known as slaves, from the border regions like Kentucky, and transporting them to the Deep South. The enormous growth there of plantation agriculture, rice, sugar, and especially cotton, created a very high demand for labor. And with a limited supply of available enslaved persons locally, prices were extraordinarily high in the Deep South, much higher than in the Upper South. The interstate human trafficker, purchasing persons in one region and transporting them thousands of miles away to Mississippi or Louisiana, could realize a hefty profit. Being sold down the river signaled a horrible fate for enslaved people. The brutal conditions on these plantations meant that laborers would live a hard, miserable, and very short life. But slavery was about business, and the economic logic of the agricultural system demanded an unsentimental treatment of the bodies whose work fueled prosperity. While some few white folk had moral qualms and raised protests, appealing to a sense of justice and the tender human sentiments, notably in Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel of 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin, an international best-selling work that inspired Stephen Foster to write his song, My Old Kentucky Home, their protests were not quite enough to sway the political tide in the southern states. The strong desire of those whose wishes mattered in Kentucky and through most of the U.S. South to hold on to a political and economic slaveocracy, a system they called simply the southern way of life, was a powerful countervailing motive and vision. So down the river they were taken unwillingly. Hundreds of thousands of enslaved African descended, mostly young people, from the hard life of slavery in the border states to the harder and even more wretched life farther south. 
An example of this trade is the journey of the slave trader Edward Stone, whose expedition of 1826 is fairly well documented. Stone's impressive home in Bourbon County still stands, material evidence of his success as a Kentucky businessman. By some accounts, Stone kept enslaved persons chained in the cellar of his home while he was buying up a sufficient number to make the expense of a long trip south profitable. By 1826, Stone had been in this lucrative slave export business for at least 10 years. An anti-slavery Presbyterian pastor, Reverend James Dickey, in 1822 recalled seeing Stone's business at first hand. As he marched a line of enslaved folk from his home near Paris, on the way to the river in Maysville. Having passed through Paris in Bourbon County, Kentucky, the sound of music beyond a little rising of ground attracted my attention. I looked forward and saw the flag of my country waving. Supposing I was about to meet a military parade, I drove hastily to the side of the road and, having gained the top of the ascent, I discovered, I suppose, about forty black men, all chained together after the following manner. Each of them was handcuffed, and they were arranged in rank and file. A chain, perhaps forty feet long, the size of a fifth horse chain, was stretched between the two ranks, in which short chains were joined, which connected with the handcuffs. Behind them were about thirty women, in double rank, the couples tied hand to hand. A solemn sadness sat on every countenance, and the dismal silence of this march of despair was interrupted only by the sound of two violins. Yes, as if to add insult to injury, the foremost couple were furnished with a violin apiece. The second couple were ornamented with cockades, while near the center waved the Republican flag, carried by a hand, literally in chains. From Maysville, Stone's human property would have boarded a long, flat-bottomed boat and be taken all the way down the Ohio River to the Mississippi River, to Natchez, Mississippi, or New Orleans, Louisiana, where the owner would sell the lot and be able to make the return trip much lighter in cargo, but substantially wealthier. So, in September of 1826, Stone's expedition, carrying more than 75 enslaved people, including children, young women, and men, began as expected. But in this case, the trip was interrupted. probably early on the fifth day going down the river. 